Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of our Conscious Conversations. This evening, I have the honor and privilege of introducing our guest, Yaakov Darling Khan. I was introduced. Welcome, Yaakov. Hello. Nice to see you, everybody. I was first introduced to you via Jenny Levine, who's on the call too. Thank you so much, Jenny. And uh, was actually booked on uh, your course that you were going to be running uh, in 2020, which ended up not happening because uh, uh, other things happened. <laughs> what a year, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Nothing like the hard, uh, uh, cold face of a wall to get your back up against to get some power moving. Right? <laughs> Nicely put. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to that course. So I hope you come down soon, as soon as flights are, you know, flying again without uh, requiring tests or vaccines. I have my commitment to come and visit my family and friends in, in Africa. Absolutely. Very important. I was actually today just listening to an interview by Dolores Cahill. I don't know if you know her. She's a, a medical doctor from Ireland and she was doing a speech in Dublin and she was saying they've just started a new airline called Freedom Airways which will not require COVID testing or vaccines so that's great you can use that one. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that airplane's got any wings. Apparently she's got a few billionaires who are very keen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, I also had, uh, really enjoyed reading your first book and uh, Jenny actually gave me a copy of your new one, which I'm going through at the moment. Uh, fantastic work. Thank you so much for all the, the work you bring to the world. It's really amazing. You're very welcome. It is. It's definitely work to write. I had no idea just quite what a journey that would be. But, you know, everything, um, everything I was writing about, I really went through in my own experience, whether it was my own life story it was like a redigestion and then all the work in the new book um very very profound like to be so engaged with that material that's been uh, so much a part of my life but to put it down into words really meant to uh, experience it through my body first of all and it's it's quite a journey really is i'm sure any of your listeners who write know what i mean well, I mean, I'm lucky. I write about food, which is quite, uh, you know, physical. It's visceral. Whereas I would think the shamanic realm, it's quite ineffable. So trying to capture that in language and syntax must be quite a tricky process. Well, that that's a really interesting place to begin because um, for me, the the shamanic world is very tangible, and it's it's it because it. It exists in two places. Yes, it, it does exist in the ineffable, as you as you beautifully said, in the imaginal, in the unseen, in the the realm that is dream and thought and image and imagination. But it also really exists in physical form. It it, it was really. I I'll, I'll I'll say what I mean. I was um, last year. I was. I always do a little ceremony on my birthday. I just pick up my drum. I light a fire on my land and go and sit quietly and digest and review and talk to my support system and i was sitting there with my drum and my eyes were closed and i was having a really deep conversation with the spirits and there i was and the wind was blowing and the trees were moving but my eyes were closed and i heard um i heard inside me that voice which i've come to recognize as the teacher voice, the one that I ignore at my own peril. And um, that voice said, Yakov, it, it's uh, beautiful that you're with us in imagination, but open your eyes. Everything that you're talking to is right here in front of you. Open your eyes. And I opened my eyes and there was this beautiful fire and the trees moving with the Dartmoor wind where I live and the sound of the river and the music of life and the physicality of life. And the, you know, shamanism is about that direct experience of relationship through being present in the body to be with, um, with you right now, with all of us, but with nature, with 
with our dreams, but to for for those of us who've been brought up in the industrial world, it's all about coming to the body, to the physicality of presence, and through that ground, being able to open our awareness or to sharpen our senses, um, to to receive what's around us, to be in connection, to be in relationship with what's around us. I, I'm pretty sure you know what I mean. And since you're so into food, that's the same, isn't it? It's relational. You have the, the, the vision of what it is you're preparing and then there it is in full 3D. It's life in a body, taste and smell and sight and hearing and and then that sixth sense of the ineffable, the the dream behind the physical world. That's fantastic. Thank you for sure. And uh, it leads us nicely into, you know, just get, giving us an idea of what a shaman is and what shamanism is, because I think a lot of people would see a spirituality as a bit of an excarnating process where you're focusing on something outside of reality outside of you know physicality and placing your attention beyond rather than here and what you've just spoken about is very visceral it's very here mm -hmm. well we we tried that version of spirituality for a couple of thousand years and it it has its merit it has its has its beauty it has its uh purity but at the same time it, that, I mean, it was of its time, but that separation between spirit being somewhere else, like the great spirit, God being in some other unreachable realm, um, that if we do as we're told for long enough and in one book or another, according to one set of rules or another, maybe then we get rewarded after we're dead as long as we don't enjoy ourselves too much while we're alive, and as long as we follow the rules, then then we get to be with spirit when we're dead. And to me, that was, um, you know, sometimes I think of it as one of the greatest contracts ever, but it's not that, I don't think there was somebody actually out to con people. I just think it was a, a story of its time. But for now, that where that story has taken us is extraordinary imagination. You know, human beings are unbelievably creative. Like everything I see around me is was somebody's imagination. And we've imagined ourselves into a techn technological world of, of, you know, very fast speed, but disembodied. So ideas, spirit, but not connected to earth. And that has um, frankly put us in quite a mess, uh, environmentally, relationally, spiritually, emotionally, um, in terms of social justice, all of these things um, have been <sighs> causing a lot of suffering uh, for, for a very long time. and. I was very blessed to meet an extraordinary woman called Gabrielle Roth, who created a, an amazing body of work called The Five Rhythms. Susanna, my wife and I, apprenticed to her for 18 years. And she, her major contribution in my life, and I think in the life of many, was, look, guys, it's time to bring the spirit and the body back together, to marry them in ecstatic union to 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 be in ecstasis which is inspirited inspired in the body here now present able to recognize um not just uh what's going on but our effect on one another and when when it's all about when spirituality is all about some reward further down the road that you may or may not achieve. Um, it, it takes away from both the power of the moment, this moment that we've got, that the heart's still beating, but also it takes away from our responsibility 
because I'm following somebody else's rules and I'm doing it good by somebody else's um, set of stories. Um, and I don't have to take responsibility for who I am, for what I actually feel and for the effect I'm having on my the, the, the life that I share this planet with, that we share this planet with. And therefore, we've ended up in this, on the one hand, extraordinary opportunity, uh, depending on which way you look at it, or, you know, deep existential crisis uh, as a species. Like, who are we? What matters, really? Do we really want to go on chasing that, either that spiritual dream, and then that was replaced by the material dream, that's the split, you know, chasing God, chasing God. Okay, now that didn't work. Let's chase material. Let's chase money. Let's chase things. That didn't work. Hmm. How about we, we look at this, integrale, um, bringing together the best of all human intelligence of our ancestors, of what we've, what we've all learned in our journey. And our ancestors, our different, our different backgrounds, the way that we see, you know, our world right now, it's, it's so kind of, I'm right and you're wrong. And um, so, so much polarity and aggravation, so much, um, you know, social media just gives us this uh, platform to just destroy one another, as if, as if there's not actually a very genuine human mirror, a brother or sister or anyone in between that I'm hurting with my words because I can just type it quick and send it out. Uh, that polarity, that lack of responsibility and, you know, the essence of our work, which, which is called movement medicine, it, we can sum it up in three very simple phrases. One is stand up, the second is grow up, and the third is play your role. And that's modern shamanism. Stand up, grow up, play your role. And grow up, I don't mean it as like a telling off, like a, a parent to a child. I mean it as the most wonderful invitation to know who we are, to know what we actually care about, to know love of self and other and life and earth and nature and each other and difference, not just to learn to tolerate diversity, but, you know, diversity is our health. It's the health of life is diversity. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> I think most people would have heard the word shaman in reference to some South American tribal setting. Um, mm. How is the modern shaman different? And is, is he she? Well, shamans uh, have been around it all around the world in one form or another in every single tradition since the word go. It's the oldest form of um, human beings' connection to something greater than ourselves. And that existed everywhere. And it's, you know, it was our way to, through rhythm, through drum, through, through achieving um, a different state. These days we might call it flow to achieve a, a, a state of ecstasis, to be, uh, be able to expand beyond our everyday awareness, our busyness, our, our little mind going round and round, trying to work everything out and getting in a confusion until we're dizzy and, you know, drop dead of a heart attack for lack of attention to our body. So, it, yes, in the modern world, the... The issue is disembodiment. It's lack of awareness of our physicality and our emotionality, our emotional intelligence. And in a, in a culture 
And what I mean by culture is the industrial complex culture, that more is best, that we have to, you know, that we have to, the economy has to grow all the time and uh, the business has to grow all the time and we have to grow all the time, which is so not what nature does. It does grow, but it also, as we know, we we have the seasons, we have the time of letting go. I look outside in here now and in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, just coming into winter, the trees are beautifully naked. They've been stripped back to their original form. They they did this glorious celebration of life with the colours of autumn, like the celebration of, oh, we're dying, we're dying, we're letting go. Let's show all our colours. And then those leaves fall and nourish the roots of the the tree for the next season of growth. But there's that resting time. So these things that I'm talking about now, these are, they're more like a thread of shamanic practice across the world, across time and space. But in the modern world, um, as well as using drums and feathers and uh, candles and incense, we're also using computers and beat boxes and machine like machine technology to create amazing soundscapes that can take people on a physical embodied journey through movement into that state of presence that is both really awake and two feet on the ground but also open in a very structured embodied way so through the roots like the feet on the ground, the backbone fluid, strong, our sexuality awakened. Not not thinking, I'm not talking about thinking about sex, I'm talking about the energy of life that's moving, that is sexual, that is creativity. And that movement um, opens our awareness to that numinous space that you described as ineffable, the dream, the dream behind our day-to-day life. So in a sense, there's very archetypal forms, but the tools that we're using, that I'm using, are they just have a slightly different structure. You know, my laptop is my is my medicine box and my medicine bag. You know, I have my music on there and we're we're incredibly blessed to live in a time where we can play and and be in relationship with musicians from all around the world. It's extraordinary the the richness of of um, soundscape that's available to us to meet and match us where we are. So modern shamanism, you know, I do have feathers and beads because I was given them by indigenous shamans who, you know, gave me these beautiful things and said, Yakov, wear them. It it will remind you of us and keep us connected. But I'm not wearing them to try to be them or to try to be in there, to be an Amazonian shaman or that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, I'm a a Jewish white kid from Liverpool. It's like, um, you know, I'm not an Amazonian shaman. I'm never going to be. for me, shaman, shamanism, one of the things that Gabrielle said is that shamanism is indigenous to its culture. And so a shaman in our culture would need to know the kinds of experiences that we have growing up, the kind of woundings, the kind of challenges that we have. And though we can, and I have, receive many amazing things from shamans from different cultures. Um, In the end, we have to translate what it is we are experiencing and really bring it into our own landscape. That's first of all, primarily the body again, but also the land that we're living on, our families, our ancestors, our traditions. So for me, it's interesting, the deeper I've gone on, the more 
in connection with my Jewish ancestors I am. And though I'm not practicing Judaism in the way that they did, um, nevertheless, I feel that the gift of their experience and it becomes more and more important. So that's the, the essence is to discover our place, who we belong to, who our people are, what our land is. That's one thing that COVID has been such a, an enormous gift for me. And I know it's been far from a gift for, for many, many, many people. But the gift for me has been that I haven't been able to travel. So for the first time in 32 years, I, I'm at home in one place for months. And if there's one word I would use to describe these months, it's landed, L-A-N-D hyphen E-D. I've landed in the place that I live. And it was a, a massive missing element in my own practice. And it's given me so much more strength, interestingly. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, there you go. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my background initially, I got into shamanism at the age of 19 through the Toltec tradition and, you know, mm -hmm. the perspective of the, the bridge keeper between who you are, the limited self-belief that you are, the limited egoic patterning that you are that tells you that you're small and have no power of your own, how do you open that person up to recognizing that there is a totality of themselves that is far beyond what they can even perceive in that moment. And so you speak about the tools and you have a lot of tools and your book is full of tools. So we'll get into that in a minute. But for me, that very much encompasses the shaman. It's someone who's just going, there's some tools that you can use to open your perception up and to see more of yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. And the number one tool of, of any journey like this is um, some sense of kindness and patience with yourself, because we've all grown up. Um, it's interesting, I'm quoting Gabrielle a lot today. And she died a few years ago, a good few years ago now, but she was one of our central teachers. And um, uh, yeah, so that 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 sense of um, being present is is the absolute key with kindness for yourself and being able to recognize that in a sense we all have survived what she described as the child wars you know the amount of suffering that there is amongst the young people in our world today the amount of self-harm, um, of suicide, of, um, you know, a sense of lostness, a sense of despair, the amount of that, not just in the young people, but in so many generations and face like we have been with this uh, huge crisis of our world, like suddenly stopped and like, who am I then if it's not, not work? So kindness, a certain level of acceptance that I am like I am, not because I'm an idiot, not because um, I was born stupid, not because I am not creative, not because of all the other injunctions that I've been told over and over again in growing up and in my education, but that there is somebody within you, within all of us, that is unbroken that is is magnificently unique is you know an absolute jewel of a being and it's our uh, part of our task in this life is to uncover that to reveal that to ourselves to discover who is that being inside me who is that one that's quietly watching quietly like um an acorn becoming a an oak tree you know the acorn isn't isn't kind of giving itself a hard time when it's in the ground looking at its great 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 grandmother going why aren't i like you 
you're so magnificent, you're so big, you're so incredible, and I'm just a little acorn. That acorn knows that it has within it everything to become that in time with, and this is the key, with support, with support from the good earth, with support from the, the, the sunlight, from rain, from clean air, with all of that support. And for humans, that's our friends, our beloveds, our family, our teachers, our, our, even the people that really push our buttons, they're our, they're our teachers too. That that surrounding, that soil, good earth that we grow in, that's community. It's um, a sense of where we belong. And that's, it's super important to have some kind of sense of healthy ground. And, you know, I, I know, we all know the statistics. It, it's, it's very sure that on this call right now, there are people who've experienced all kinds of woundings. And um, I, I want you to know that it is absolutely within our power to heal, to heal, no matter how bad it was, we have it within us. We have, we call it the unbroken. The unbroken is that part of us, sometimes we call it the inner shaman, that archetype that's within us, that knows itself as earth and as sun and as water and as wind that knows itself as a greater power. And those tools are within us. They're really within us. We're made from them. That's fantastic, thank you. And I think one of the chapters in your book that for me sums that up so nicely is the vicious circle versus the medicine circle. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. So, um, I was working in the Middle East for many years, following a vision to, to go there, working with Israelis and Palestinians and um, trying to um, support a creative dialogue, uh, uh, listening to one another as a human being rather than just as a, um, a, a symbol of enmity. Um, and yeah, as I was there, I, I, the years that I was going there, and I, you know, I still go there, at least I used to before the COVID and hopefully will again. Um, what I noticed was this, um, and I can say this as a Jew, um, that my own people, we were, we were competing for being the biggest victim. And like the Middle East is full of that, like who's really the biggest victim of who? Who's, who suffered most? And we try and put these in the, on the, some kind of scales and, you know, it always ends up in our favor that we're the ones who suffer most and you're the ones who are doing it to us. And this story called blame and shame is, it's a pandemic that existed way before COVID. It exists inside ourselves. We, we have an inner persecutor that criticizes ourselves. We have an inner victim. We have an inner rescuer that thinks it knows um, all the answers and is going to impose them without even asking. And right at the root of that is that this hungry ghost, which is the original wound, the original challenge or suffering of incarnation that we are trying to avoid on the one hand but also really trying to heal and we we try to heal it by in all our relationships have you noticed how it doesn't matter you know you can be with you know in serial monogamy like one relationship after another and each time you're certain this is the one and after a little while, you're back in exactly the same story you were. And in the end, you notice that the only person who was there on every occasion 
was me. Oh, maybe this has something to do with the lens I am looking at the world through, this lens that I've worn for so long that I've forgotten I'm wearing it. I think this is reality, but it's not. It's a perception based on past experience that I am repeating in order to try to heal it. So in order to heal it, we need other different archetypes. And in movement medicine, we work with these. So the, the medicine for the victim, well, first of all, the, the victim has to recognize how rageful they are. Like we play the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, this kind of small thing. And then there's all this passive round the back, passive aggression, because we're furious and we're terrified of our fury. So first of all, there's that need to recognize the, that fire that needs safe space and a safe channel to express. Um, and then through that, we discover the fool. And the fool is, is really good medicine for the victim because the fool has no past. The fool has no future. They're just like, oh, this is interesting. What can we do with this? What can cr we create with all of this material, including our wounds, including the challenges right now? Uh, what can we create? They're very playful. So we have archetypes and medicine archetypes for, for all of those shadow roles, because if we as a species, and this is what I mean by grow up, this is the grow up part of movement medicine. We have to embrace our past. We have to acknowledge the hurt, not just in our own biography, but in our people's story. My people, the Jewish people, uh, uh, you know, we've been doing being oppressed for thousands of years. And there's a lot of hurt there. So we have to acknowledge that, we have to find a way of releasing that, of purifying that, of shaking it out of the bones, sweating it out of the tissues, crying it out of our eyes, bringing the, the sweet blessing of healing waters to our aching hearts and, and souls. And we all can do that step by step, take responsibility for, so that the past isn't between us and the present. It's at our backs, inspiring us to move forward, to stand up, to grow up, to take responsibility for what we feel and to stop hiding it behind polemics and politics and ideas to be interested in who we're actually with and who we actually are and we can do this makes me think this weekend uh, or last weekend i did a, a workshop to learn the haka with a maori shaman and it was amazing he um when he started off i mean he's so fierce it's like you are the pinnacle representative of your ancestry going back millennia. How does that feel to own that and stand in that? And it was just such a powerful expression. Wow. That's beautiful. And that's that that fire also of of magnificent masculine man energy. It's so important that um, that we we cleanse that, we re-own the, the beauty of masculinity. You know, I, I meet so many young men these days who've been told that masculinity is toxic. It's just toxic in its essence. And therefore, I'm toxic in my essence. And so then you get these kids, you know, I, I know, you know, who end up harming themselves to the point of suicide because they're told that who they are is toxic. 
because there's been a war between the feminine and the masculine for so many thousands of years. And whose fault is it? It's the masculine's fault. And who's the victim? The feminine's the victim. And of course, there have been oppressors and victims. That's absolutely true. I'm not denying that. However, it's not how these things work out. We are powerful as human beings and we don't. The most dangerous thing that we can do with our power is to not recognize it, to actually think of ourselves as smaller than we are, to not recognize the effect we're having on each other by playing small. Absolutely, sure. So one of the things I love about your book is that it is full of practical processes that you take people through. Um, you know, there's ceremony in almost every page. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about ceremony and, you know, the purpose for it. Thank you. Uh, you know, rituals as part of life, very important. Rituals are, they are spaces for us to take stock to digest, to stop for a moment, to rest, to pause, to listen in, like, where am I? What's going on? To receive our condition, to embody that, then to offer up what's going on in us, to offer it back up through dance, through movement, through rhythm, through song, through, um, through art, through carving, um, to, so rituals are, they're like amplifiers, they're deliberate spaces where we, we call an awareness of our connection to a greater force. Uh, that, that can be very simple, the earth of my body. This body is earth. I am a solar powered being, it's a simple, physical, scientific fact. And without the sun, I don't live. And the sun is literally shining in my cells. This movement is solar power. It's sunlight that's being expressed. So I am connected to that light of the sun, to the fire, to the, to the flame, to that power to transform, to you know, the fire has this extraordinary quality to reduce everything back to its original elements. And it releases that f heat and light in the process. And so we learn how to bring ourselves to, through what's inside us, through the earth inside me, I can connect to the earth underneath me, through the fire, the light in my cells, I can connect to the light of the sun and the light where that comes from. The sun, apparently 93 million miles away from us, um, is one of the smallest suns in our, in our universe. Tiny, tiny thing, still kind of um, rather hot. <laughs> and what a force that is. That's, that force is within us. So in ritual, we, we make a link the fire in me, the fire outside me, the sun, the waters, I'm 65% water. Then through that fluidity, I, I allow my being to become like water, to become fluid. And in that fluidity, those rigid, held, contracted stresses of my everyday life get softened. They can, they can go back to mist, they can go back to rain, they can, they can become a raging river of movement so that I can be released from that stress. And then the breath, the wind, to, to be uplifted by our breath. And this quality then stills us and it, it helps us to remember what your your Maori shaman was inviting you to do, to, to stand with an awareness of our ancestry behind us, to know where we come from, who our people are, 
to see our descendants, whether we have our own children or not, to recognize that my life is going to have an effect on the generations that follow. So that seven generations, uh, beautiful phrase that we make decisions that benefit the seven generations behind us and in front of us. And, you know, the study of epigenetics has started to recognize that actually um, transgenerational trauma, you can map back approximately seven generations, it turns out. So those are old guys, they, they, they kind of knew what they were talking about. And um, so ritual just gives us this space alone sometimes, but also in community and ritual now it's not about belief you, you can come believing in jesus or buddha or or nothing it it doesn't matter belief is not the key in ritual experience is the key your openness to the possibility that there's more to me and you and this than i have as yet come to experience and to open myself to that by putting myself into, in our work, into the, the beautiful big arms of the beat, of the rhythm, of the dance that holds everything. I've worked with uh, my own trauma, I've worked with my people's trauma, I've worked with um, some of the most horrific trauma that human beings can do to one another in ritual to heal to acknowledge so that the story gets told so that the the experience gets acknowledged so that once something has been heard it can rest if it's not being heard if it's being brushed aside like the colonial history of um, the british empire just brushed aside not taught in schools at all until hopefully in these days, there's going to be a change. We can just brush that aside like it didn't happen. And, and that, that not telling of story creates enormous suffering for everybody, actually, for everybody. So rituals then become this space where we can hear one another out of the realm of right and wrong. And just in the this is my experience and if i can put that into movement into song into sculpture into into a dance then it's no longer just a solid hidden ice cube somewhere in my heart keeping me away from love keeping me away from risking loving so ritual is it's 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 close to as important as food i would put it you know just after food in terms of our survival needs sure amazing thanks for that <laughs> and uh i think you grounded ritual in such a beautiful art through your movement medicine and you've been chatting about it through our conversation so far but you know, having worked a little bit with things like uh, magical passes and integrity over the years through Castaneda's work, you know, the move movement medicine and having done some of Jenny's movement medicine dance classes, just such an amazing opportunity to let that story unravel and to be free in your movement. So tell us a little bit about movement medicine and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I, you know, I should tell you that when I began this road, I was not looking to dance. I hated dancing. I was like one of the most self-conscious dancers you're ever likely to meet. You know, I needed to be somewhat drunk and then I would only dance to one tune, which was a, a terrible song called Here We Are in the Monkey House by a group called Animal Magnet. But for some reason it got me going. And, um, but I, 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 I hated dancing and it, it turns out actually the reality that it wasn't dancing that I hated. It was that feeling of self-consciousness, of feeling uncomfortable in my own skin, of feeling disconnected from the wisdom of my own kinesthetic intelligence, my own, uh, the unbroken, you know, life is movement. 
And it's another thing that Gabrielle said. The only difference, she used to say, between a living body and a dead body, it's movement. Dead body, no movement. Living body, movement. Therefore, movement is life. <laughs> and um, So when we dance, and not to do somebody else's steps, I love that kind of dance. I love forms. I love the kata. I love the martial arts. I love the, the different forms of movement. That's, that's one thing, and it's very helpful, actually, for our stability to learn particular forms of movement in the body. It really gives us a physical stability. But as, alongside that, to learn to trust the dancer inside us that is the intelligence of life, that is movement, to let this body be moved by what the experience is, by the beat, by our emotion, to let emotion be what it is, energy in motion, so that we're not holding everything together and trying to be spiritual and sitting on our beautiful cushions in perfect, rigid stillness, sitting on all of our frozen hearts and trying to be nice, normal, neurotic, spiritual beings who smile nicely at everybody until they get home and explode at their loved ones. Um, we, you know, for us who, who live sedentary lives and not very physical beings, we, in order to still, to get still, we have to move. We have to really give ourselves to the beat. So movement medicine is a set of very specific practices that are easy to learn. Um, they, they're step by step and they give, give you a ground of, of um, context so that, so that step by step, you know, we can just give the head, the shoulders, the elbows, the hands, we can give the heart, all the different chambers of the heart back to the dance, we can give our history to the dance, we can give our present moment, we can give our questions to the dance. And the amount, we've been doing this for 32 years, and the, the thousands and thousands of times I've had people say to me, you know, I, like, like you, I, I wasn't really that into dance, but I came along because my girlfriend was into it or because, you know, somebody told me about it and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm in a bit of a rut. I'll, have a, I'll give it a go. And, and like me, you know, it took me 20 minutes to just go, I wish I'd discovered this when I was three years old. You know, <laughs> this was, I, was, I was lucky I was 22 when I discovered Gabrielle. And um, it, it literally took 20 minutes for me to break out of self-consciousness and that prison of being worried about what do I look like? Who's looking at me? You know, am I doing the right movements? Have I got the right clothes on? Am I wearing the, you know, what, what have I got? You know, all of this kind of rah, 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 rah. and what movement medicine and practices like it do is to help us to shift the focus of our attention and therefore the focus of our identity, away from the kind of, you know, thinking about what we're thinking about, what we think about, thinking about thinking, um, it, to be in the actual experience of the body, the, the tangible experience. What does my body feel like when I breathe and when I move? And actually this, process of bringing the attention back to the body it's like um it's a reclamation of our own colonized physicality our physicality is colonized by memory by the past it's in our muscles and by bringing our attention back and giving bit by bit each part of the body back into the river of the dance, into the fire of the dance, into the ground and the wind to, to be moved. We are 
reclaiming this territory. We're reclaiming the extraordinary intelligence of the body, which is different intelligence to the heart and different intelligence to the mind. And we're rooting our intelligence in the body so that the heart can be held, has a home, and the mind can settle. And then it, it's a bit like by focusing the mind and grabbing it and putting it in the body, at some point the mind just opens like a flower and we can receive memory, information, inspiration, vision, connection, um, in all different areas, all in the whole circle of life, our ancestry, our future, our companions, what's going on at work that keeps happening to me. Just when we dance deeply, we get, it's, it's bringing the, the intelligence of the body and the heart and the mind together. The light switch is on, that's from my Jewish ancestry, the, the triple woven candle of the body, heart and mind is the light of the soul. So, you know, it's, it's not even about not thinking. We have to use our mental intelligence because if we don't, we'll have an ecstatic experience, but then we'll just go back to how we were because we haven't translated that. We haven't really used that um, capacity to really digest an experience and ask what it means to us in our day-to-day -day life and what what strategy might I, I adopt to, to root that experience, like a planting of a seed so that it can grow. That's, that's so important. So it's not all about far out experience. It's, it's about gathering those pearls there and each pearl is a seed and planting it really in our day-to-day -day life you know I'm without I, I said to we had a meeting with all of our apprentices not all but at many of them um last week and I was saying to them listen guys you know in these times you've got to practice an hour a day you you've got to give that time to your practice and I know we're busy. I, I'm really busy. So I just I go to bed a bit earlier and get up earlier now so that I can have that time to practice, to do my practice before I begin the day or before I rest at night, to have a refuge, a place I can return to, to be with what matters to me, to remember why I'm doing all this stuff in my day-to-day -day life. What's it for? Because if I don't, I'll just get busier and busier and busier until I die. And then I'll be there breathing my last breath going, what the was all that about? What was that about? And that's such a sad indictment of, a, of the modern world that we don't get to um, put at the, the core of our, of our education of our children, the discovery of who we are, what we love, what excites us about life, what's going to give us the juice to, to be, get up in the morning and be ready to enjoy our work rather than working for something we couldn't care less about in order to have two weeks to do the things we think we want to do, half of which we spend ill recovering from the other 50 weeks of drudgery. We have to have an hour a day or, you know, and if you can't take an hour, take five minutes, start. But I, I really suggest an hour. And I've got so passionate about this recently that I've just designed a course based on the on this book, which I'm going to be offering next year online for people, which is going to be that intensity of practice. So an hour a day and, you know, we're going to go through the rituals in that book and step by step prepare the ground to meet and know and deepen that relationship with this brilliant archetype that's the inner shaman 
that is not some freaky, alternative, strange thing. It's just the part of us that knows itself as part of this great mystery in physical and in non-physical form. Beautifully said, thank you. I'm definitely keen on hearing about the course. <laughs> and I think everyone's uh, very keen to hear more about how to get into uh, the movement medicine. Where where would you, I mean, I've put your website um, on the chat screen, but where do you want to direct people so they can get involved, get a taste of movement medicine? Obviously right now, physical course aren't really happening. Well, we, well thank you very much. I'm really pleased because one of the things that um, my wife is super, uh, brilliant on so many levels and she for the last couple of years was receiving the instruction stay home and, and reach out globally so for the last three years before the pandemic we were preparing to launch an online practice space and we launched that in April and that's it's called the 21 gratitudes movement medicine study hub the website is www.21gratitudes.com and that is um we we're doing monthly practice we're doing very simple bite-sized it's very affordable that's one of the things we were it's made our work super accessible um and we're also if if you're interested in that the next open event is the 19th of december which is a solstice um ritual three hours with great music and a little time to digest 2020 and by god it needs some digestion doesn't it to digest to release to shake it all out a bit and to to create more of a a, a blank page to recreate ourselves for the new year so that's on the 19th of december that's open to anyone again 21gratitudes.com you'll find all the information there. Fantastic. I think that uh, answers Tracy's question quite nicely. Tracy starts on the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> medicine that way. <laughs> Actually, in hard lockdown, we did one of your um, online uh, movement medicine classes. It was amazing. You really ah, feel like you're in a group of people, even though you're that, by yourself in a room. That That is, we've been astonished by that. I mean, you know, there's plenty of... Uh, really modern science that recognizes that we're connected anyway if we're in the same room or not right now when i when i look and sense you i feel you in my body i'm with you it's not the same and it will never replace being in the room together and neither should it let's hope it never does however it's a it's a it's a beautiful addition and we can really go quite deep in our work Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the time you've given us this evening. And I'm sure many people got some great things out of it and uh, certainly an inspiration for getting moving and getting dancing. I mean, just put on some music and let your hair down and get free. <laughs> Absolutely. Let your hair down. I've already let all mine down. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you for the work you're doing. And if I may just say um, for everybody here listening now or who sees this recording that I really wish you and your family's good health and happiness and what you need to discover more about who you are so that you can have the great contentment of giving your gifts into this world because that's the gift of this life is to give what you've got. Awesome. Thank you so much. For everyone who's listening, if you think you have a friend or family member who'd enjoy this chat, we are going to put it online within the next week. Uh, all of our previous guests have been recorded on our website. Uh, you guys can have a look at the website address there. Yakov, have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much. Lots Thank of love from South Africa and hope to see you in person sometime soon in a dance room. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, Bye, everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.